When you own the world and you have only 90% control of something, it looks like you don't have any influence. You have to have 100% control. I wanted to talk in this uh, sort of conversation about um, capitalism as such and how it can affect our free speech and how it can have an effect on journalism and so on. And uh, I wish I had more time, but have another interview coming along in half an hour. So let's see what we can do. Well, let's see what we can do. I'll try to cut it into clips later and send it to you. <laughs> very rushed. Yeah. Ever so Okay, so I'll rushed. try to keep it uh, to the point. So first of all, let's set the stage. So you wrote Manufacturing Consent. This was what, like 40 years ago now, 50? Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Maybe. And in it, you had five, uh, well, I'd let you tell it. You had five uh, points, right, of uh, how journalism is captured by the government. We did modify it in 2002. We had a second edition and changed the fifth filter. It was too narrow, so broadened it. No other changes. Right, you changed. So the fifth filter went from basically communism to Islamism or terrorism or something of that nature. So basically, what I first I wanted to just say, interestingly, I found that in the last since 2016 to 2020, the MAGA Republicans uh, seemed to almost go past you in their distrust of the media. So 40 years ago, the liberals and people on the left, like yourself, were distrusting media as a mouthpiece of the government. Somehow, through Trump's term, the people on the right were saying that even though they were in power in government, that the media was actually kowtowing to the Democrats and so on. So what do you make of that? That the MAGA Republicans are almost, were almost more distrustful of media than yourself. Well, what's happened since, uh, I mean, Republicans have always had overwhelming control of the media, uh, the mainstream media, the owners, the advertisers, mostly all business and closely connected with the government, which is closely interconnected with the, even dominated by the business world. But when you have, when you own the world and you have only 90% control of something, it looks like you don't have any influence. You have to have 100% control. But uh, we see this very often. So the very interesting moment was the uh, switch from uh, the sort of regimented capitalism of the New Deal period up through the 60s to the on to what became the neoliberal program of pretty much un, uncontrolled capitalism, limited control. And the, the one, if you look at the documents in between there, they're very revealing. So one of the famous one is the Powell Memorandum, uh, uh, a, a memorandum written by a right-wing uh, lobbyist, corporate lawyer, later became a justice of the Supreme Court uh, under Nixon. He wrote a memorandum to the American Chamber of Commerce, and which is very interesting reading. He said, business is in trouble. Business is being attacked all over the place. Uh, everyone hates us. The media hate us. Uh, the universities are indoctrinating people to hate us. Uh, we've just lost everything. We're being under constant attack. And uh, he says, it's strange because we have the money. So how are we allowing this to happen? To us? Uh, we have to have a counteroffensive to use our money to try to get a little bit of exposure in the media and the universities and so on. I mean, when you read it, it's comical. It's like a, a three-year-old kid, spoiled three-year-old kid who has all the toys except one. 
you know, some of his younger brother took the, that one toy, so he's in total despair. I have to have all of them. I mean, the idea that business was under attack is so ludicrous that you can, you know, even a way that'll laugh, but it had a big effect. And it was part of a major effort by the corporate sector to try to take back almost complete control, not just 90%, but everything. And then you move on to the neoliberal era. And right. it's the same kind of complaint, like uh, the regents at Yale University claim that the uh, university is being taken over by uh, woke liberals, conservatives don't have a voice and so on. When you take a look at what's done there, you don't even know whether to laugh or cry. I mean, All right. So you kind of feel that... Same with the media. Uh, the mainstream media are basically centrist. They're on the, but there are other media, like say talk radio, which is rabid for a right. I mean, beyond description. Uh, people like uh, Rush Limbaugh were reaching 20, 30 million people a, a, a week, you know, and uh, Fox News came along far right, you know. But, well, that's what uh, I wanted to uh, kind of discuss with you. So the last 20 years, I wanted to pose some uh, a thesis to you that I personally subscribe to, but you know I, I see this happening, and I want to get your take on what uh, could could have been happening. So, first of all, I think two major things happened in the last twenty years. One is that the internet has disrupted the traditional journalism, you know, like the Walter Cronkite and the New York Times editorial desk, and so on and journalists had to adapt. So because we run a for-profit uh, enterprise, the news organizations typically run as for-profit or they, they have to pay their employees. So they adapted by essentially creating more biased and more clickbaity uh, articles and nothing sells like outrage. So my thesis is that the news media by being profit-driven had to, it's the capitalist system selected for the news media that doesn't tell both sides of the story. So for example, if you're listening to the Daily Coast or you're listening to the National Review on different sides of the aisle, they need to lock in a loyal audience. And if they tell both sides of a story, then the story will seem like no big deal. Like, oh, I see what happened there. It's not really a, a newsworthy story in the first place. So I think that the character of news was shaped by the need of journalists to adapt in the era of blogs and independent media, essentially. What do you think of that? The question arises, what does both sides mean? Actually, in the United States, both sides means centrist to far right. Uh, it's a little different. I should say the things have changed in some ways. Like take the New York Times, it has columnists now who are pretty far to the left, which never would have been permitted in the earlier years. It's opened up in that respect. And that's, I think, the effect of the, it's a long-term effect of the uh, activism of the 60s, which did civilize the country considerably under tremendous resistance. Powell memorandums, just one of many examples, but it had an effect. And a lot of young people who grew up in that period just have different views and different attitudes. Many of them have worked their way into the media and it's had an impact. So there's still the kinds of institutions they used to be, major corporations owned by bigger corporations, which sell a product to a market the market is advertisers, product is readers, and uh, totally closely linked to government, uh, strongly linked to the indoctrination system in the university. So it maintains its basically sort of centrist conservative caste, but changes. Well, there yeah. Are, you didn't hear before. I, and that's quite different. 
but uh, so it's a mixed story, I think. I, I very much think it is a mixed story. There's so many views that I see in today's America uh, with libertarians and the on the left and on the right. There are, if you can believe it, some libertarians on the left as well, although there are few and far between. Uh, there's also different progressives and, and uh, people, uh, conservatives. I would even argue that you're absolutely right. In the 60s, the free love movement and all of the civil rights movements and everything liberalized society to a great extent to the point where I would say today's so-called right-wing, uh, let's say Republicans like Ben Shapiro would be considered liberals in the 50s when it comes to sexual uh, and racial and other uh, norms. Uh, I would say that they would be looked at in the 50s as liberals, uh, which is, I'm talking about just the social sphere, not the economic. Uh, but remember that what, what is called left liberal in the United States is basically centrist. Um, there are a few voices that go beyond, but not much. The general picture is keep to the doctrinal, within the doctrinal system. You can see it in case after case. I mean, take, say, Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie Sanders, the kind of left liberal columnist in the New York Times would say his programs are very good, but they're too radical for the American people. So they can't implement them. Now, what are his programs? Actually, uh, one of the leading uh, columnists, associate editor of the Financial Times in London, world's major business journal, Rana Farahar, I really recently had a column in which he was saying only half in jest that if Sanders was in Germany, he could run on the Christian democratic program policy, the right wing Paul Krupp. Because what are his policies? Universal health care. Who doesn't have universal health care? The United States. Everybody. That's too radical for the American people. Uh, free higher education everywhere. Mexico, Germany, Finland, everywhere, Brazil, wherever you go. Right. Now, that's what's called the left in the United States. This is too radical for the American people. Or take a foreign policy. Uh, take another one, which kind of interesting, which appeared yesterday. Interesting article by one of their lead uh, foreign policy commentators, Stephen Lee Myers. Uh, uh, I happened to have a conference yesterday with a representatives from many Latin American countries. And I just, out of curiosity, read a paragraph from his column in it. They just burst out laughing. Uh, the, I don't have the exact words, but it was something like this. It was about how China is challenging the liberal international order established by the United States which is based on rule of law, uh, support for democracy, and support for human rights. You read a phrase like that to anybody in the global south, they burst out laughing. That's the United States, the country, the only country that's been condemned by the world court for and basically international terrorism, and of course rejected it, uh, the country that has uh, overthrown government after government that invades every other, any other country it wants to, that imposes the only country in the world that can impose brutal sanctions that murder tens of thousands of people. That's the country that established the liberal uh, order rule, you know, people just laugh, you know, but in the well, United that's States, certainly the, uh, that, that's certainly that's, the party line. I think in the United States, but every country thinks of itself as uh, liberating. I think the Soviet Union said right. that they were liberating the world from imperialists uh, because but, they were. See, but some countries we are now we are able to look at them and say that's a joke. Okay, so when Russia talks about its brilliant, its marvelous Stalin constitution, which had all sorts of wonderful things in it. We don't even bother laughing, uh, but you're right. Every imperial power in the past has been very much like us. Uh, when the French were slaughtering people in Algeria, they were uh, the intellectual classes were talking about the civilizing mission. 
uh, when uh, England was uh, carrying out horrible atrocities all sorts of the, all over the world. Its leading intellectuals, even people like John Stuart Mill, were praising England as an angelic power, so marvelous others can't understand it. Now, that's pretty normal. But the inability to look at our, there were exceptions. People like Adam Smith, for example, who bitterly condemned what he called the savage injustice of the English in their destruction of India. But they're pretty rare. Most of the intellectual classes, the educated sectors, just repeat the propaganda. Join the intercoincommunity.org. Literally, just go to community.intercoin.org, right? Yeah. And sign up. And then what I'd like you to do is, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Start a new topic, right? And just even if you don't have any questions, just introduce yourself. We have a thing here, like it's going to show up, like introduce yourself. And mm -hmm. we're going to reach out to you because what I want is not just for people to invest in Intercoin. I want people to understand Intercoin and to get involved in, and join the movement, right? And we can only do that if we are all kind of communicating and we're all building it together. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, you know, you can either drop your email in the chat if you haven't already or just sign up on the site and we will uh, circle back. Thank <laughs> you.